This is Blacklisting Bad Guys with IP Tables. My name is Gary Smith. I'm the, a cybersecurity analyst at the Pacific Northwest National Laboratory in Richland, Washington, over on the dry side of the state. We are actually getting more rain than we usually get by this time of the year. We're up to all of about four and a half inches of rain. This is usually this is quite a bit for us because we're usually on at about two and a half. So everything is nice and lush and green for a change rather than being disgusting brown. Okay, um, what do we do at Pacific Northwest National Laboratory? We are a Department of Energy lab. There are 17 labs nationwide in the Department of Energy laboratory system. We do a lot of different kinds of stuff there. We do biological stuff, we do bio environmental research, we do stuff with waste, with waste disposal, um, lots of very interesting things. And we need computers to do that, very large computers, and I do the cybersecurity for some of the large ones at the lab. So, to set a little bit of context, how do you think about security? Do you even think about security? Hope you do. Um, but I think about security through what I call the five golden principles of security. First one, know your system. Know what runs on it. Know what your user base is like. Know what the performance characteristics are like. How does the network usage go? Just know how things work, how they should be going, what's normal for your system. The principle of least privilege. Don't give processes people, systems, networks, collaborators, clouds, more privilege than they need to do their operation. For instance, do you really want the CEO of the company to know what the root password is? <laughs> Probably not. If you do, you have a problem. Defense in depth. Think of uh, rings of a tree, concentric rings. If an attacker breaks through the first ring, he's got another ring that he has to defeat, and another, and another. Eventually, they'll give up, you hope. But the idea is to not just do one thing and say, I'm good. Hey, I got a firewall. I'm good. I've got antivirus. I'm good. I'm HIPAA compliant. I'm good. Okay? Prevention is key, but detection is a must. You can patch, you can harden, you can do all sorts of things to make sure that your systems are secure. But if you don't know that something has gone wrong, it's like Bill Paxton says in the movie Aidens, game over, man, game over. You have to know that something has gone wrong. And the last one, which is mostly our topic for today, know your enemy. Know what techniques he uses, Practice them yourself. Try breaking into yourself to see if you can withstand what they're going to try. So, do you look at your firewall logs? I hope you do. I certainly look at mine. You'll know immediately that there's all kinds of weird, creepy characters out there on the internet trying to break in. Believe me, this is true. Where do they come from? They come from everywhere, and I do mean everywhere. This is a heat map of one of the systems that I have on the internet, and various places around the world, red being, red big dots being the most active, that have tried to attack the system and get in. China, Mongolia, Korea, Japan, Indonesia, Australia, South Africa, Brazil, somewhere in Nebraska. <laughs> hey, you know, um, California, Canada, you name it. They're coming from everywhere. Um, and looking at these kinds of maps for several years, uh, the only place that I've never seen an attack come from is Antarctica. <laughs> the reason why is that there's not very many people there. 
and they're trying to stay warm so they have more important things than to try to launch internet attacks. What are they trying to do when they're trying to get in? The most common thing, SQL Server. We have been trying to patch SQL Server and not have these kinds of attacks succeed almost since the inception of SQL Server. Why do the bad guys try? We had 10,000 attempts in a week from 33, from 3,000 sources. Why do they try it? Because SQL Server is the Swiss Army knife for intruders. You can do all sorts of things with SQL Server attacks. For instance, local file enumeration. You can steal the password file. You can steal the shadow file. All sorts of things. You can find out what ports are open if you craft your SQL Server attack just right. Um, Microsoft Terminal Server, hijack sessions, uh, VNC, same thing. Um, for some reason or the other, people like to put printers on the internet. I don't understand why. Uh, most printers these days are controlled by an HTTP interface. So, guess what? If you can break that HTTP interface, you can possibly get back into your corporation. Putting a, putting a printer on, on the internet is kind of, kind of a weird thing. Um, I used to have, years ago, uh, this bozo from Gdansk, Poland, that kept trying to uh, uh, break the protocol on, on uh, Epson printers. It, that was, it was always funny, because he'd shoot 8,000 of these at, at a time. So there's lots of threats out there, lots of possibilities for threats. Um, this didn't really come out very good, but a program that I run, an open source program called FW Logwatch, will take your syslogs and produce a very nice report that tells you um, over a time span um, and the interval uh, what happened on what interface from a source IP and your destination IP and what type of attack it was. I got tired of looking at this over and over and over. Drop by firewall input, drop by firewall input, drop by firewall input, just on and on and on and on and on. Finally, I said, you know, I really need to start blacklisting these bad guys so that they're not getting at my system, so that they don't even get to the front porch. So I did some research, and there are lots of blacklist sources out there freely available on the internet that you can get, free for download. Um, these are a list that I compiled for my use. Um, they're all free. You can get them. Um, they're all available just through HTTP. Um, so uh, some of these are my fa are, are, are favorite ones. MaxMind is a company that sells GeoIP location services, but they also make a very good anonymous uh, list. Um, the counterintelligence U.S. Army malicious IP list is another very good list. Blocklist.de, another very good list. Um, but these are all ones that I found out there free on the internet that you can use. So, it's scripting time. So, Got all these lists now, got their URL. So what we do is, but first let's create a list to pull all of these bad IP addresses from all of these sources. Next, we're going to remove the duplicate addresses. That's pretty easy. So that we don't, we, we have a nice compact list. And now, just because I'm persnickety, I'm going to sort them for readability so that uh, I, I can look through them through them much easier. And now I'm going to take those IP addresses and I'm going to format them into IP tables commands that look something like this. Append to input, the source is this IP address, drop it. Append to input, the source is this network block, drop it. Append to the input, another source drop it. And on and on and on this goes, and soon you've got 60,000 or more of these rules, and it's yikes. 
Oh no. Yuck. Houston, we have a problem. Most uh, can, the best candidate for understatement in the 20th century, which, by the way, was not said by Jim Lovell, was actually said by Jack Schweiker, who was a command module pilot. But yes, Houston, we have a problem. The problem is, is this does not scale. This just does not scale. 60,000 or more IP tables rules? Uh-oh. The reason why is that net filter rules are like a trap door. If you will imagine a corridor, long corridor, with different sized and shaped holes in the floor, and these blobs of different sizes and shapes come to the beginning of the corridor, and there's this little pixie that has to take those blobs, and he has to try to fit those blobs of different sizes and shapes into various, all these other sizes and shapes there in the floor until one falls through. That's how IP tables works. So if you've got a bunch of rules, like 60,000 or more rules, testing each individual IP address, you've got a problem. The problem is that um, you've got to make those matches, and this requires a substantial amount of system overhead. Now, if you've already got a, a system that's heavily loaded, and now you're being bombarded by all of these DDoS packets coming in from around the world, and you're increasing the load by trying to do all of this analysis of 60,000 IP tables rules, you're only going to make the situation worse. So, again, the problem doesn't scale, but there's a way around this. That's really pretty clever. It's called IP set. IP set is a match extension for IP tables. What you do is you create lists. They can be lists of addresses. They can be lists of ports. They can be lists of networks. They can be lists of combinations of networks and ports if you want to do that. And then you use those specifications of lists in IP tables rules to do any number of various different things. A set is just a list. It can be a list of addresses, it can be a list of ports, um, but it facilitates fast lookup. Um, IP set stores, say, a bunch of IP addresses as a hash, and we all know that hashes are fast. So, an example of an IP set. IP set create blacklist. It's a set of network addresses and store this as a hash. That's one of your options on the way to store it. Then you just add stuff to the blacklist. Add blacklist address. You can also add a cider block of addresses. So if you know that you're coming, you're, you're getting blasted by a particular cider block of addresses, you don't have to put each one in individually. You can just do it as like a slash 24 address. Once you've got that set <laughs> built up, you can use it in an IP tables rule. What this says is that if the source is in blacklist, log it. Do this one more time. The source IP address matches something in the blacklist, we're going to log it and we're going to put out a nice pretty message with it. We can also, once we've logged it, because we like to keep statistics on stuff, if the source matches something in the blacklist, drop it. Poof. Gone. Okay. So now it's scripting time again. What we're going to do is we're going to do a little bit of modification to our script. We're going to modify our commands that we're going to generate so that instead of generating IP tables commands, we're going to generate IP set commands instead, and they're going to look something like this. A whole big long list. Let's talk about them. I'm going to create a blacklist. 
the exists says if it's already existing, don't worry about it. It's going to be a set of network addresses and it's going to be a hash. And that sets what my hash size is and that sets how many elements I'm going to have. That's just something. These are just parameters that I've played with to make it all work. And then I just start adding them, generating those sorts of commands. Now I've got to go back and I've got to modify my, uh, my tables configuration a little bit. So at the beginning of HC sysconfig IP tables, I'm going to modify it to look like this. There's all the stuff that sets our policy right here. And I have two rules, very much like what we saw before. <coughs> if the source address is in the blacklist, I'm going to emit a nice pretty message that's going to go into my syslog <laughs> file that says IP, IP blacklisted input. And then if the source is in the blacklist, drop it. So straight away, the bad guys don't even make it to the front porch. They fall off the end straight away. Poof, gone. Okay. Now, how good does this work? Surprisingly well. Surprisingly well. Um, with just those lists, the blue bars down here are addresses that were blacklisted and never made it to the front porch. They just went away. They never made it past the front porch. They weren't analyzed at all. And then this is other ones that got, got dropped further <coughs> along the line. So all in all, not too bad. But we can make it better. We can make this significantly better. We can add a custom blacklist. Now, remember that nice, pretty HTML thing I have from FW Logwatch? That's one option to its output. You can also have it put out a summary that's just plain text. Well, if it's text, I can manipulate it with awk and sed and Perl and Python and all those wonderful <coughs> Unix utilities that we're used to. So when now what I do is I run FW Logwatch, outputting the text. I extract the offending IPs from that table that is produced. Put that to a file. A little bit of scripting time again. This time I change the IP set command to generate some of my uh, custom blacklist. I run the script. I get my new table list. And then lather, rinse, repeat. Do this daily. So that every day I get new sets of bad guys incorporated into my list. Um, initially, when I was doing this, testing it out, I ran it daily. It worked great. It worked really pretty good. So then I thought, well, let's try this a little more frequently. So now what I do is I run it every hour and once a day. So if I run it every hour, I catch the bad guys that are hitting me real rapidly within that one hour time frame. But if I also, by doing it over a day, I catch the low and slow guys. They're doing me one or two to three times a day. So I catch both the short range and the long range guys by running it every hour and once a day. Lather, rinse, repeat. And now it looks like this. Ooh, even better. Now, blue bars down here, these are guys that didn't make it to the front porch. These lighter blues up here, those are the ones that have made it all the way through the drop list. Much better. Question? Yes. How do you know good guys from bad guys just looking at your log? Okay. How do I know? Yeah, which ones you want to block and which ones are okay. In terms of? Well, like your blacklist that you have. Oh, well, yeah, maybe yeah. there's some legitimate so users. Yeah, how do you? Yeah. Added. Um, well, okay. Um, I, actually, I meant to talk about this. I, I forgot this. 
Okay. Gary, can you repeat the question? Could use us to say it's classified? Uh, pardon? <laughs> What's that? No. Um, repeat the question. Okay. How do I know that? How do I know that the that that somebody on the blacklist is you really on? Is what? You have a white list. Oh well. Okay. We'll, we'll, we'll get to that. We'll get to that. But okay. I, I meant to talk about this, but using these blacklist sources. There's a fancy term for this now in the, in the security community. This is called threat intelligence. Okay, threat intelligence. Let me, let me draw, let me explain what threat intelligence is by drawing a parallel to cloud computing. Th this is a lot of buzzwords here and this would probably choke even a marketeer's throat. Um, <laughs> What's the difference between what, what, what's the difference between my data center and cloud computing? My data center is my computers. Cloud computing is somebody else's computers. What's the difference? What, what about threat intelligence? The, the private blacklist is my syslogs. Threat intelligence somebody else's syslogs. Other people, lots of people from around the internet contribute to these blacklists. So that's where the threat intelligence comes from. It's somebody else's syslogs. So. So, so are those lists reasonably reliable? Do yes. They, I mean, how, how bad, how often do they have somebody on their list that shouldn't be there? Um, yeah, and how do you get yourself out of that list if you end up on it by mistake? Um, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to put that this way. Uh, how do, how do I know that the lists are good? Okay, um, the lists are good because other people have vetted them, and they say they're good. Also, they're contributed from around the internet, so. Uh, they're good that way. Um, I, I trust implicit. I'm going to trust the counterintelligence division of the army to only have good stuff. Uh, I'm going to trust Max Mind to only have good stuff because they're a corporation and they depend on that. Also, this is a, a threat. This is risk transference. Uh, I'm making the problem of whether or not the list is good somebody else's problem rather than mine. Yes, sir. I think one of the security tenets you mentioned at the beginning was to know your enemy, which includes using tools like what they use. Right, right. It seems like that would easily get you on one of these. Yeah. Lists. Yeah. <laughs> yes, sir, in the back. If some college kid decides to scrape your website, how would, and he is not or she is not on any of these lists because they're just using a library computer for a few days, how would you catch them quickly enough so they're not hammering you? Um, I would catch within them in, within an hour. Um, well, actually, I, I'm about to talk about that. Um, okay. Yes, ma'am. Well, how often does the list get updated as the IPs that were considered bad are no longer bad? Because if somebody's been attacked or you've got spoofed IVs or, or zombie systems, once they're cleared, they, they're now good, so they shouldn't be blocked anymore. Uh, again, that's the prob that's, that's not my problem. I transferred that risk to the owner of the list. So they will update them regularly and drop them? Oh, they will update them regularly. But uh, that's, that's one of the fundamental things of computer security is transferring risk. It's not my problem if somebody gets on the list. And, and, that's, and the other issue is if somebody's legitimate and they're not reaching you, They'll probably let you know somehow. Yeah. Believe me, that is true. <laughs> if, if, some, if, if somebody is, if a legitimate site has gotten onto a blacklist and it ends up in my blacklist and they shouldn't be, believe me, they will let me know very quickly, but that doesn't happen very often. Yes, I just sir. thought I'd add that I used to work in the internet advertising industry and we dealt with things like uh, spamhouse.org and other places that would actively monitor spam operations. And if somebody gets on a list they shouldn't be on, 
you can easily get off by just telling the person running that list, hey, I'm a legitimate operation, here's what I'm doing. Yeah. And if, if you're telling the truth, they're actually very good at um, um, vetting you on that. that. So yeah. Yes. But, yeah. but Spam House can be generous and just block the whole aid. Yeah, good, good luck talking no. to an army to get yourself off the roast list. <laughs> okay. Uh, in answer sort of to your question about, say, somebody's um, like uh, uh, on a lab computer here at the college and they're, they're blitzing me. Um, that actually happened to one of the sites I managed. We got hit by a scraper from college. Yeah. They had to respond much quicker than... Uh, um... <clears throat> This is a feature I use to take care of that. Um, IPSET has an extension so that you can dynamically add or remove things to lists. They're not necessarily just static lists. Um, so you can add them to rules, add things to rules on, on the fly. So what we now do is we now have our IP tables configuration looking like this. I've added some rules my help here at the top. If the desk, if the source is using coming in on any one of these ports, they get added to the blacklist immediately. Then it gets logged and then it gets dropped. Now, what are these ports? 23. Telnet. 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 My favorite. My favorite, Gad. 2017, Telnet, yes. Yeah. Um, yeah, Telnet. You would be surprised at how much traffic I see, or used to see, <coughs> as Telnet because bad guys are out there doing banner scraping and they're looking for unsecured Telnet servers. There are tons of equipment out there still on the internet that use Telnet as their management media. It's still being manufactured today, too. Yes. What's that? I just bought a whole, like, a dozen PDUs for my rack cabinet that still use Telnet. To oh, yeah, absolutely. And that's what they're looking for. They're looking for that kind of stuff. Um, 1443. SQL. 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 2323. I don't remember what that one is. Alternate Telnet. Um, <laughs> no, actually, that's not an alternate Telnet. I think, oh, I, I remember now. 2323. That was Mirai Botnet. I remember now. That's the Mirai Botnet. What about Port 21? Pardon? What about Port 21? Well, that's FTP. FTP, that's And I, I'm not going to block FTP because I have users that have legitimate reasons yes, to be using FTP. If you have thousands of connections from one IP, would you? Um, actually, I can rate limit that through another mechanism, that's but that's really outside mean. of the... Yeah. But as a professor of mine in courses used to say, that's beyond the scope of this course. Um, <laughs> these, all of these ports here, um, this was not handed to me on stone tablets from Mount Sinai. <laughs> I used some uh, analysis, very little actually, and determined that these were the ports that they were using most often. Outside oh, absolutely not. Why would I provide Telnet as a service? <laughs> <laughs> this is, this is a, probably a worse invitation to disaster than having MySQL on a server. <laughs> yes, sir. So would there be a disadvantage to saying, okay, the only thing I'm trying to provide is 443. And, and so say, look, if it's not 443, just drop it immediately. You're trying to do something. I mean, it'd be a very long list unless you can do a range somehow. Yeah, that's that's another possibility, but um, in my situation, I, I can't do that. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay, so now, and, and believe me, um, someone fires up a, a port scanner like NMAP. They will be They will be using port 23 almost immediately. Bingo. They hit this trap, they get added to the blacklist, and then they get dropped straight away. From then on, I don't have to worry about them. Now, do you add these things to the permanently to your blacklist, or do you have to do you reset your black blacklist, your custom blacklist? Um, oh, the the yeah, the ones you're adding. The ones, the ones I'm adding. Okay. Um, what happens is, is that 
I run the custom blacklist every hour. I run the run the update every hour. So if a site has been added this way, they'll drop off. But if they try again, they'll immediately go back on. So they fall. They they go back onto the blacklist immediately, and then they fall off and never get to the front porch. Um, what happens if? Yes, sir. Uh, how long is your black blacklist? Uh, just what's, what's the length of it? What's the, how many how many uh, entries does it have right now? And how long it will take before you get all the thirty-two bit IP addresses? <laughs> <laughs> um, as it stands right now, um, I have between a hundred thousand and a hundred and thirty thousand either I, separate IP addresses or CIDR blocks. So, but still, that's not very many when you consider that there's four billion possibilities out there. So, yes, sir. So let me clarify. I think you, I think you suggested earlier that. Rather than looking at each individual address, what you're really doing is creating a hash table and really checking the hash table to see if it exists or not, which is, that's a much quicker lookup than going through the whole thing. Oh, I mean, absolutely. A lot, that's... Of, a lot of firewalls do that, too. With, oh, yeah. With, with Once they establish a temporary connection, they put it in a hash table, and then when... A, when the well, yeah, that, that's, that's, how, a stateful, that's yeah. how a stateful firewall works. Yeah. But this is... The same, same this is the, basically the same principle as maintaining a hash table of of IP, of connections, but these are addresses that I don't want to deal with at all. Yes, sir. So, in, in the larger scope of things, is this just on one machine then, on one network connection? No. Or do you put this on each and every single? I have a I have numerous. Um, systems that are directly connected to the internet and I'm running this on all of them. Now you're probably wondering about about what happens if something is on one machine and should it be on another machine, right? Okay, I, I'm looking at that. That is a research project for future development and possibly a talk for next year. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Um, and when I was doing my on Windows NT4, which I know is ages ago, um, one of the things our instructor told us was that by default, all the ports are open, and it's our responsibility to close off ports. What is the rationale behind keeping ports open by default instead of closed by default? Because Microsoft programmers are lazy. <laughs> no, um, I, I think you can. I think you can generalize that even further. All programmers are lazy. Um, says the admin. Say, right, right. Says says the security admin. <laughs> all uh, all all programmers are are lazy and ignorant about security. Um, part of the part part of the, well, okay. I so, have. So you don't put this on a few machines and front end the connection into from the internet. Through, that, through them to, the, to your real uh, servers behind it? Um, in some cases, yes. In some cases, no. Okay. okay. Um, the, these three lines right here, this sets our internet policy, and our policy is accept on everything. Well, I can't, th that's generally the way everybody does it because what everybody tends to do is they say, well, I don't know what I may have to deal with, so I'm just going to accept everything and then selectively block it, and hopefully I will remember to put a drop rule at the very end. Um, my, my personal opinion is that um, you should set input and forward to drop at the very beginning. Um, but that's, that's my personal opinion. And uh, the opinion of my management is, is that we're going to have an open acceptance policy. And we just write our rules to deal with everything possibly coming in from the book. 
Um, so you could conceivably exclude these ports, right? Unless, <laughs> unless you want to use them for detection of nefarious purposes. Um, well, I mean, you are not really open, right? As soon as you go to, to the line number four, you decide no. that these ports are not allowed, right? Right. These ports are not actually open. They're not actually open, but this is just the most likely ports that people are going to be using to try for for scanning or something. Let's see. Um, yes, sir. May I make a comment? There's a difference, sir. 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 There's a difference between ports being open and ports being attacked. Um, right. So you drop it to prevent the CPU over resource utilization, to, even though you never have the port open. Well, drop yeah. These Right, it's, it's, it's two things you're trying to limit. You're trying to limit the CPU overhead of the, uh, of, of, of <coughs> managing, uh, of trying to figure out do I need to drop this, plus there's also the overhead of increasing the latency of the packets queued up behind the one that you're trying to process. So you're trying to increase the network, the net, you're trying to decrease the latency Increase the bandwidth and lower the CPU of the system that's having to deal all, deal with all of this. And reduce the disk space for logging. <laughs> yes, and reduce the disk space for logging. Right, right. Um, yeah, disk space for logging. We had a question back here. Yes, sir. Yeah, I'm sure this. The uh, uh, answer to this is obvious. I just wanted to make sure that this is mainly for web-facing computers. Something. Like no. No, this is not for web-facing computers. Not so. Well, I mean, if the, if this was your home computer, and you're not pa you're not passing any ports through your uh, firewall to that computer. I mean, I'd say this it wouldn't be a bad idea, but it's it's uh, pro this is probably not necessary, is it? Or should this should if you've got a dozen workstations in your home that are not acting as web servers? Should you still be doing this on every single workstation? Let me ask you. Let me let me ask you this question: Do you want the Chinese in Beijing, Guangzhou, Nanking, and probably a dozen dozen other sites banging away on those twelve workstations trying to get in? Probably not. No. I certainly wouldn't. I agree with that statement. I certainly wouldn't. Uh, China, China, bless their heart, is one of the biggest um, offenders at trying to get into my stuff at PNNL. We know all about it. What's that? We run honeypots. We know all about it. Oh yes, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Then, yeah, honeypots. Yeah, that's another favorite subject of mine. Maybe yes. another discussion. Yes, sir, back there. Um, if you know that okay. you don't have clients in a certain area, you know for sure that they're never going to be there. I have not had to do that yet, but it is well within the realm of possibility that the Department of Energy or the United States government in general says, you are going to block any communication to or from North Korea, for instance. I have that built into the script that generates my blacklist so that if I have to and I get the order, I can block North Korea, everything, by the country. That is built into the script because I, I figure this is going to happen at some point, that I'm going to need to block a country because of something having to do with political activity. So that is built into it. I know Jay was interested in that because he gets a lot of stuff from China. We all get a lot of stuff from China whether we know it or not. Uh, and he's interested in just blocking a whole country. And yes, the script does have that capability. Uh, yes, sir. If you put, let's say in this example of 12 workstations, if you put that behind <coughs> one machine, the back as a firewall, do the, the ones that are behind this PC acting as a firewall or server acting as a firewall, you need to still put in place these rules on the on the uh, ones protected, or does it can it only be 
No, you don't. You don't only want to put it on the firewall. But if you're really paranoid, you could. Um, some people's paranoia is rather. What's that? Yeah, it's your ring policy. You might you you might want to do that to ha increase your, your your visibility and and do that sort of thing. Yes, sir, back there. So is that blacklist hash? Is that um, is that safe to file at all? Like, is it going to be persistent across reboots, or are you starting sort of starting afresh? If you, um, or as or my my script <laughs> generates a file of of commands. Of the of the known ones, but oh. the stuff that you're dynamic or the stuff that you're dynamically gathering. Okay, but well, okay. Um, the dynamic ones aren't being stored, but if they're on the dynamic list, odds are they're going to show up again. Okay. In which case, they're going to fall into one of these traps and fall onto the dynamic <coughs> list again. Yes, sir. Is there any way you can make IP tables talk to some kind of in memory database so then you have like one repository that all servers talk to? Okay, so you, yeah. Like a simple GUI that even business users can check? Um, with regard to having a, a database across all of them, um, well, I am looking right? into that as a possibility. <laughs> there is a program called. Um, oh, Valum D. Anyway, what it is is it's a uh, it's a repository for that kind of information. Um, I'm looking into that. I haven't decided whether or not I want to go that route. But yeah, that that is a possibility that if system A uh, gets hit by an address from Lower Slobovia, it goes into a table, and then system B can refresh from that and know that Lower Slobovia is a bad guy. And not accept anything from him. Yes, sir. Uh, to extend on uh, blocked countries, what do you do with a client that's using a VPN out in a country that's being blocked? VPN out? Out. A VPN inside of a country that's being blocked. Um, I have not had that situation yet. Um, if if they're if they're bad, they're bad all the way around, okay. and you I'm not going. They may not be bad though. You may have a client trying to connect a VPN from Iceland. Um, I've not had that situation yet. Um, yes, sir. This kind of connects to my question a little bit. Is wouldn't the strategy here to be to isolate your incoming streams based on the function? So, for, like, for example, if you were to take your your main, let's say, a VPN in IP address to your network and basically block everything but VPN coming in on that system. And if you have a public-facing service that you isolate it to a different IP and treat that differently mm -hmm. and only allow that particular service to come in on that IP um, and then block everything else. And uh, with VPN, again, have a, you can have a, a different IP coming in. So that IP only allows VPN connections by your clients. Um, you know, at, at, the, the worst case scenario is your public facing uh, website, let's say. Mm -hmm. Don't post it in your internal network, post it <coughs> somewhere else. Mm -hmm. And so those att attempts on that web server, if that for some reason that web server were to be compromised, that would minimize the risk because it would be elsewhere and not on your network. So okay. you just have a pivot attack. Take um, over the web server pivot. Right. So it's, it's, yeah. it's a way of dividing minimizing your risk by, would that be a strategy? I mean, in my, well, um, in my mind, if you've got all these different functions, you'd right. branch it into separate areas. So if one area is compromised, that doesn't affect your other areas. Um, that would be a good general strategy, but I don't have that luxury for setting that up. Uh, some of the architecture was foisted on me by sure. outside sources. I see a strategy yeah. where you get eight IPs or seven yeah. IPs, and not only do you have to know which IP to come in, but it, that IP only offers one service to come in on that IP, yeah. and it blocks everything else. Yeah, but, yeah. So, so just, right. just some ideas on Just there. an idea. Um, let's see, where were they going? Oh, yeah, okay. Um, let's say that I'm getting bombarded by 
um, I suddenly get bombarded by port 9999 from a whole bunch of IP addresses out there. With this scheme, how would I take care of that? Well, I fire up my editor of choice, and I edit the line, and I put 9999 in there, and I close the file, and I start IP tables up. Start, I stop it, and I start it up again, and everything's good, reasonably good. Well, that's a lot of work. What about if I could do something a bit more dynamic? So, IP, IP set is not just for IP addresses. You can create a bitmap vector to store what ports are of interest to you. And since there are 65,536 possible ports, that's actually a very small bit vector. So that's not going to take up a lot of space. So what I do is I create a blacklist for ports. I create a bunch of TCP ports. It's a bitmap. And there's the range, pretty standard. A bunch of UDP ports. There's the range. And now I add those invalid ports to the bitmap. Just one right after the other. Not very much. And now I change my IP tables rules again. So that now if I met if the source is going to the destination with a port that's in either one of my blacklists, I log it, I drop it. So now, if somebody comes in on a port like 9999, all I do is add one simple command on the command line, IP set add blacklist TCP port 9999, return, boom they fall off immediately. I don't have to edit a file. I don't have to restart IP tables. Yes, sir? If there's 65,000 of them, can you just generate a scripted blacklist and then put all of the ports in there and then just delete the, one, the five or six ports that you legitimately use? I don't have that luxury oh. because on quite a few of the systems, they have very large port ranges open, and they are using, so I, ha I have to leave them open. I have to leave them open. I don't have any choice on that. So, um, yeah, it would be nice to just block a whole bunch of them off and then, yeah. But no, I've got, there, there's a lot of, a lot of the software that I'm, having, that I'm, that I'm forced to deal with uses very large port ranges, and they're very dynamically generated. So I'm kind of stuck on that one. Um, that's, the, that's the sad part. Um, so you whitelist the ones that need to do it, and then just blacklist everybody else? Um, well, you mean whitelist everybody that I'm going to be dealing with? Yeah, and then you're blocking everybody else because they shouldn't be on this. Um, I don't know who those might. I don't know who those whitelisted may be. Um, you don't know who they are, and you're automatically blocking anybody off those ports, and you block everybody, so you might as well shut the port down. Um, I I really don't have that luxury. It would be nice if I knew exactly who my clientele was on certain things using this software, but but I don't because it's worldwide. Um, Here's where Igor throws the big switch. <laughs> Igor throws the big switch, and now, lo and behold, everything's getting blocked. I'm blocking lots of people off. They're not getting to the um, they're not getting to the front porch. There are only very few people who are actually going through all of the chain to be um, to be finally dropped. Okay, a tweak. Add a whitelist. Why do you want to add a whitelist? Let me tell you from practical experience. Your clients 
your users, your collaborators, your business partners, they're going to do something stupid. <laughs> if you don't believe this, let me tell you, it's true. A partner, collaborator, business partner, whatever, somebody on that end may decide, gee, I can't connect to these guys. I'll run a port scan to see what ports they've got open. What happens? They fall on the blacklist. Um, believe me, this happens more than I would like because people are stupid. Um, they don't just call me up or, or something like that. So, create a white list of what you want to allow. For example, create the white list, add somebody, and modify your IP tables configuration again so that if they're on the white list, they get logged, and they fall through. <coughs> Great for your collaborators or um, clients. Another little tweak, blacklisting for output. I built up this big long list of IP addresses that are on my blacklist. So now what I do is I add a line like this to my configuration that says, on output, if the destination is on the blacklist, log it. Now, riddle me this, Batman. Why don't I put a drop there? Because bad guys will know when you cut them off. Exactly. Bad guys will know that I cut them off. I want them to continue on, and I'm gathering intelligence about if this happens, if I see this pop up, I know that one of my intern one of my machines is trying to contact somebody bad, and I can start doing forensic stuff to determine what it is they're doing and gather intelligence about this. And uh, we have a counterintelligence group within Pacific Northwest National Laboratory. If something like this were to happen, I call them up straight away and say, hi, I've got some syslogs for you. And they go, oh, great, send them on. They love that kind of stuff. OK. Now, you put this blacklisting in place, eventually your manager is going to come to you and say, how's that blacklist thing working for you? George Bush imitation. <laughs> oh, that reminds me. We were talking about North Korea earlier. What does Donald Trump and Kim Jong-il have in common? The Saint Barber? I don't know. Close, close, <laughs> close. Bad haircut. Yes. Bad haircut. Somebody needs to take them down to supercuts and treat them. Anyway. Treat them how is the question. What's that? Treat them how is the question. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. Okay, so your, your manager comes to you and he says, how's that blacklist thing working for you? So you run out a chart for an entire month that shows blacklisting versus what goes through and eventually hits being dropped. Gee, that's like 98%. 98% of the bad guys never make it past the front porch. And then you tell your boss you're welcome. And, what, and you tell your boss, you're well, yes, you're welcome. You're doing good. Um, this is, I, I, I actually kind of, doing a little bit of statistics here. Uh, this is one particular system that I've managed to tune very, very well. On some others, I'm getting between 84 and 95 percent. But this is, this is how good you can get it to be. Yes, sir? Yeah, to go back one step, does whitelisting an IP address override override blacklist. Let's, let's say the example before you black, blacklisted all of Iceland and you've got one legitimate customer that you know is in Iceland. If you whitelist him? He would white, right. You could whitelist him and he would take precedence. He would, he would go, re, re, remember, uh, re, remember something about um, I, the way IP tables works. 
IP tables is first match wins. As soon as you make a correct match, you're out of there. So if you put your white list first, which is going to be very restrictive, and your black list, which is going to be much more general, your good guy comes in, your one good guy comes in, he gets accepted, poof, he, he makes it through. All the rest of them, nope, they, they hit the black list and they fall off. Yes, sir? Not yet. <laughs> Not yet. I'm I'm waiting for that. I'm waiting for that. Is that um, a challenge? Pardon? <laughs> I, I'm sorry. Is that a challenge? Uh, <laughs> is that a challenge? Um, I'm sure that that is a, that that is potentially going to happen at some point, because um, my. My users, my collaborators, my clients are um, not necessarily sysadmins or security people, and they're, prop they're potentially running uh, stuff that may be potentially compromised, and uh, that's certainly a possibility. Um, I haven't seen it happen yet, but I'm waiting. Okay. Um, conclusions. There. Yes, sir. I don't want to invite criticism, but how adaptable is this to firewall D and journal D? Okay. I am going to say this about that, <laughs> as Richard Nixon would say. Um, that is beyond the scope of this course. <laughs> Yes, I will have a follow-up next year because I do have this working on a system with Firewall D at the moment, and I'm keeping a very close eye on it. But yes, I, I am keeping an eye out for that. Um, yes? Um, theoretically, haven't looked at it, I'm just looking at a post, because I'm faced with doing this, is support for IP set has been added to the get repo of firewall D as of a version released after December 2015. As a matter of fact. So that's from firewallD.org, and that's uh, a year and five months ago. Well, actually, that brings up something that, that I was going to talk about uh, since <coughs> this gentleman here asked about firewall D. Firewall D in RHEL 7.3, CentOS 7.3, uh, Scientific Linux 7.3 has to have IP set to work. Fail to ban, FAIL to ban, great program for uh, restricting access when bad guys come knocking on, say, SSH, HTTP, any number of other traffics. They now use IP set. So, IP set is there if you're running a modern, a modern, uh, a modern Linux. It's been in Ubuntu for a long time already. Um, so, but yes, um, I am under consideration. I'm taking into consideration how to put this into Firewall D. Um, I'm sort of looking at maybe rich rules, but the rich rules are still kind of poor. They don't let you do a whole lot of things. But yeah, that is that is a consideration of mine. Yes, sir. So to gather a lot of this information, have you been playing with Honeypots at all or Snort IDS? Um yes. Uh, let me say this about uh, about that subject. Um, gathering a lot of this information, um, there's a uh, a wonderful package that's open source called Security Onion. Yes. That has Snort. If you like Snort, it has Suricata built into it, and it has um, a lot of other stuff built into it that you can harvest um, okay. bad guy IP addresses and attack vectors from. Um, I use that uh, on my on my internet facing stuff. Um, it's great. I love it a lot. Okay, boy, we're getting close to raffle time here. Okay, IP set, many features, capabilities. Enhances IP suite, uh, IP tables. Um, use IP set 
for blacklisting or whitelisting. Makes a great combination. Keeps the bad guys off the front porch. There's my email address if you want to send me email. If you want my generating script, email me. I'll email it to you. <laughs> Thank, Thank you for, for coming. coming.